Hi, my name is Eric Kim, and in this lesson we're going to compare and contrast the solvents in SN1 and SN2 reactions. We're going to continue summarizing what we know about SN1 and SN2 reactions, and the focus of this video will be the characteristics of the solvent in the two nucleophilic substitution reactions, and why each solvent type is uniquely suited for the reaction. Keeping in mind the key determining feature for how fast each reaction proceeds will give us a lot of clues for the appropriate solvent. In SN1, everything is centered around the stability of that carbocation. And I remember that SN1 is all about the carbocation by drawing a line through the one and remembering I need to keep in mind that positive charge. I have at the bottom here terpylo chloride, and the very first step in an SN1 reaction is the formation of our carbocation. In order to do that, we need to kick off our leaving group. Then we form our carbon with three methyl groups attached. And a positive charge on our carbon atom, as well as our chloride anion. Polar product solvents are great for stabilizing our resultant products. So I'm going to draw water, which is a classic polar product solvent. We have a partial negative charge on our oxygen and a partial positive charge in our hydrogen. And you can see that it's well oriented to support the formation of our carbocation. In addition, it's also going to support the formation of the chloride anion. So it's going to encourage that leaving group to leave. The other thing you want to consider is our nucleophile. Remember in S1 reactions, the rate limiting step is the formation of the carbocation. It actually doesn't matter about the strength of our nucleophile. You can imagine that a nucleophile which has some electron density associated with it will also be solvated by a water molecule. But that's okay because the nucleophile strength isn't really the major concern in S1 reactions. So you can have solvation of the nucleophile and the reaction will still proceed because our carbocation is so strong of an electrophile. In SN2 reactions, the nucleophile is the star of the show. In the bottom, I have bromomethane. And I'm going to use a specific example of a nucleophile this time. So let's say our nucleophile is going to be potassium hydroxide. So in solution, potassium will dissociate, will get a positive charge on the potassium, and will have a negative charge on our hydroxide anion. Our hydroxide is going to attack the middle carbon and then kick off the leaving group like so. In this example, let's use a common polar A protic solvent like tetrahydrofuran. So tetrahydrofuran is a cyclic ether molecule and it has a partial negative charge on the oxygen. This is going to be able to stabilize the positive charge on the potassium ion, but leave the hydroxide anion alone. We really want to let that hydroxide anion be able to do its work on attacking our carbon. You might also want to consider the fact that there is likely some partial positive charge on our tetrahydrofuran. And so you might wonder, well, how come that doesn't work on stabilizing and maybe shielding our nucleophile? However, notice how bulky this molecule is. Even with the partial positive charge on the rest of the tetrahydrofuran, it's not going to be able to form any intermolecular forces with our nucleophile. Let's consider one last thing. What if I made a mistake and I decide to do this reaction in the presence of water? Well, look what happens. If I have water molecules in my reaction, it's going to arrange like so, and there's going to be a partial positive charge, and then I'm going to form some hydrogen bonds with our nucleophile. In essence, I'm going to shield my nucleophile from doing its attack. Therefore, we cannot use polar protic solvents with an SN2 reaction. Let's see this in action with our applied question. An organic chemistry lab assistant is asked to retrieve a solvent to be used in an SN2 reaction. To ensure that the reaction proceeds correctly, which solvent should we be using and why? So let's think about what's the most important aspect in SN2 reactions, is to preserve the ability for the nucleophile to undergo its attack. So we need to pick a solvent that essentially leaves the nucleophile alone. It's able to stabilize any of the resulting reactions, but it's going to not bond to the nucleophile. I'm going to draw a hypothetical nucleophile over here, and then let's take a look at our answer choices. First up, we have ethanol. That's a two carbon group with an oxygen, and then we have a hydrogen. 
Since the hydrogen is attached to an electronegative oxygen, we have a partial positive charge on that hydrogen and it's able to hydrogen bond now to our nucleophile. This would shield our nucleophile from doing its job, and so ethanol is not a good solvent for an SN2 reaction. Our second answer choice is acetic acid. The carbon attached to another carbon, and this has a carboxyl group, an oxygen attached to another hydrogen. Again, we have a partial positive charge on that hydrogen. It is attached to our electronegative oxygen, and this is also able to hydrogen bond to our nucleophile making acetic acid not a great solvent for an SN2 reaction. Since we're only left with one answer choice, let's see why acetone is a good candidate for an SN2 reaction. Acetone is a three carbon molecule, and it has a carbonyl group on the middle carbon. If you look at the distribution of electrons on this molecule, there's a partial negative charge on this oxygen at the top, but notice that oxygen is not bonded to any other hydrogens. Therefore, it is not able to form a hydrogen bond with our nucleophile and is therefore considered a polar aprotic solvent, and acetone is a great solvent for an SN2 reaction.